Hello, everyone. I think the time is uh, up and uh, we can start our session. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um, today we are going to have the session called the uh, Functional Composite Materials. And uh, uh, the time is uh, from one o'clock to three o'clock. And uh, I'm the session chair. Also, I would like to introduce our co-session chair, um, Dr. Yun Huang. And uh, he is from UT Austin too. And I'm an associate professor at UT Austin Mechanical Engineering Department. Our first talk is 1D and 2D nanocarbon alignment for multifunctional composite. The talk will be given by Ken Nan Song from Arizona State University. Uh, now uh, the floor is yours. Would you uh, please um, display your slides? So the talk uh, for this session, all the talks will be 10 minute talks and uh, there are 13 talks in total. Thank you. I don't think Dr. Song is here. Maybe you can help to play this video. Oh, he has a video. Uh, oh, I let's think see. So. I, um, oh, would you um, be able to help play the video because I have not, never received any videos? Oh, okay, uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, this is Saili Zambulkar. The topic of my presentation is 1D and 2D nanoparticles alignment for multifunctional composites. Um. Can you hear it properly? No, I couldn't. Okay, I'll let me see. The revolution in nanoparticle synthesis has led to a variety of building blocks of different shape, composition, pattern, and functionality, thus making it highly suitable for the synthesis of high functional, uh, low dimensional systems. Uh, I couldn't hear anything. Would you try to check, please? Uh, yeah, I will try it again. Recent development in additive manufacturing show potential to assemble And the particles uh, in uh, in 3D printed polymer within the 3D printed polymer matrix. In 3D printing, nanoparticle assembly it and deposition is, right is assisted with uh, shear forces, electrical magnetic field, uh, piezoelectric field, and evaporation.
I think there are still technical issues. Uh, uh, do you find it difficult to play this video? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what's uh, going on. I, I think there is another host in this meeting room. Maybe he can play it. Another host? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Oh, he, he is working on it, I believe. Okay, uh, I think if this video is very difficult um, to be played, we need to pay attention to time because there are already six minutes left, like uh, uh, finished and there are only four minutes left. We could qu quickly probably uh, play from a certain slide. Um, Um, hello, everyone. I think right now there are technical issues with playing the video sent from the um, presenter. And uh, right now, um, uh, how about we take a couple of minutes break? We'll start again at 3.10. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, our second speaker can prepare for the presentation. And the title of the uh, speaker's talk is um, um, like a... Um, Ashes characterization to reduce carbon dioxide. Uh, it's a uh, uh, composite laminate materials with low dielectric loss, theoretical model, and the dielectric characterization. It will uh, be given by M Mala uh, Sagola, and uh, he's from uh, University of Varinas in France. So we'll um, basically um, start the presentation precisely at 3.10. Thank you, and uh, yeah, we apologize for the technical issue, like uh, the video could not be played. Thank you. Also, uh, is our next speaker here? Maybe you can already share the slides. Okay. Uh, and prepare for the presentation. Okay. Sergal, and I am going to present you my work about structural composite laminate materials with low dielectric loss. Is it working properly? We approach these topics yes. through theoretic model and dielectric characterizations. I will first present the context and the purposes of this work. Then I will introduce the characterization.
Good morning everyone, I'm Mel Sergol and I am going to present you my work about structural composite laminate materials with low dielectric loss. We will approach this topic through theoretical model and dielectric characterizations. I will first present the context and the purposes of this work. Then I will introduce the characterization devices that we used and the materials that we studied. After presenting the dielectric study, I will end with a discussion and a conclusion. This work is a part of a collaborative project named STARCOM. In English, that means breakthroughs, antennas, systems and technologies in composite materials. The two main purposes of the STARCOM project are the functionalization of structural panels made of composite materials through the antenna embedding and the miniaturization of antennas and integration devices. By diversifying the operating frequency bands, the consortium aims to open new applications and new markets. For this work, we are interested in the multifunctional materials for radio frequency communications. More specifically, we work on the antenna implementation into load bearing composite panels. Some open literature studies have already worked on this kind of topic. For example, Kim et al developed a multiband aerovehicle smart skin antenna operating at 300 MHz. They used a radiating element made of plastic and copper stacked between two structural composite face sheets made of glass fibers. At higher frequencies, Manak et al developed a pure composite laminate antenna. By inserting a patch of carbon fibers into a laminate made of glass fibers and polyester resin, they obtained an antenna working as well as a copper one from 600 MHz to 2.1 GHz. Another embedded antenna technology consists of integrating the different elements of the antenna into the layers of a composite sandwich. UAL did this between layers of honeycomb to develop an antenna operating at 12.2 GHz. However, when we look at the fibers reinforced dielectric laminates classically used for antenna applications, we notice that these are mainly made of E-glass or S-glass fibers associated with polyester, vinyl ester or epoxy thermosetting resins. We note that these materials highlight relative permittivity around 4 and loss dielectric tangent always higher than 0.01. These values are given between 1 and 75 GHz and could be relatively high for electromagnetic wave transparency. For the present work, we just focused on organic matrix composite materials. These materials are known for their lightness, their mechanical resistance, their insensitivity to corrosion, and their ability to embed new applications. From different couples of reinforcement and matrix, we theoretically and experimentally study the dielectric characteristics in order to highlight the best load-bearing composite laminate for antenna substrate and radome applications. To measure the dielectric characteristics of our composite laminates, we use two different devices. The first one is the impedance measurement. By a local measurement, this device pro provides information from 100 MHz to 1 GHz. At higher frequencies, we used a free space measurement device. By using the reflection and the transmission of the electromagnetic wave, we obtain information from 18 to 26 GHz. These two devices allow to retrieve the complex dielectric permittivity from which we deduce the relative permittivity epsilon r and the dielectric loss tangent, tangent delta. Regarding the materials studied here, we have three types of fiber, fibers, the quartz fibers, the S2 glass fibers, and the E glass fibers. Because these reinforcements are fibers, we were not able to characterize them by impedance measurement. We thus retrieve their dielectric characteristics from literature. These three types of fibers highlight relative permittivity epsilon f from 3.7 to 6.4 at 1 GHz. Regarding the dielectric loss tangent delta f, we have values from 0.0001 to 0.0031. To make a composite laminate, we have to associate these fibers with thermosetting resins. We have thus selected three natures of resin, the ureton acrylate, the polyester and the epoxy resin. We are then casted these resins into silicon molds and we measured the dielectric characteristics by impedance measurements, as presented previously. At 1 GHz, these resins highlight relative permittivity, epsilon m, from 2.6 to 3.1, and dielectric loss, tangent delta m, from 0.005 to 0.025. 
Only with this data, we can see that the quad fibers and the ureteran resin presents the most interesting dielectric characteristics for the targeted applications. This gives a first overview of what will follow. To associate these fibers with these resins, we implement the classic vacuum infusion process. During the fabrication, dry fabrics were stacked onto a wax glass slab and placed under vacuum. Fabrics were thus infused jointly with the liquid thermosetting resin. After polymerization, we obtained nine separate composite laminates that you can see in this table. We retrieved the fiber volume fraction from the number of plies, the mass of fibers, the fiber density, and the plate thickness. This parameter will be necessary for the theoretical study of the dielectric characteristics that we will see on the next slide. Before proceed to measurements, we wanted to estimate the dielectric characteristics of the laminates by theoretical calculations. We thus studied various mixing rules as the maxwell gannett law. This three-dimensional model considers spherical inclusions inserted into a host medium to compute the effective permittivity of the composite media. This effective permittivity can be represented at the macroscopic, macroscopic relative permittivity of the composite. However, this model considers the composite media as lossless materials. In our case, we wanted to compute the dielectric loss of four materials. We thus used the Sivola's works to compute the complex dielectric permittivity of composite from the maxwell garnett world. As Ball and Cotari did, we then considered the fibers as two-dimensional cylinder dielectric inclusions embedded into a dielectric matrix. We finally assumed that the 2D maxwell garnett mixing rule can compute the complex permittivity of our composite laminate, epsilon asterisk comp, from the complex permittivity of the resin, epsilon asterisk m, the complex permittivity of the fibers, epsilon asterisk f, and from the fiber wave friction. This thinking is suitable for frequencies lower than 3 GHz. At higher frequency, the wavelength of the electromagnetic field is not large enough in comparison with the dispersion and dimensions of the fiber used. To compare the theoretical values computed from the adapted 2D Maxwell Garnett hole, we implemented impedance measurements from 100 MHz to 1 GHz. The results show that the relative permittivity of the composite laminate is controlled by the nature of reinforcement. You can see on the left graph that the highest values of relative permittivity are obtained with laminates made of e-glass fibers. On the contrary, laminate made of glass fibers presents the lowest relative permittivity. Regarding the dielectric loss, results are mainly controlled by the nature of the resin. So, we see that the laminates infused with epoxy resin have the highest dielectric loss, while the laminate made of urethane acrylate and quartz fibers presents the lowest values, which is 0.0031 at 1 GHz. To complete these results, we made free space measurement from 18 to 26 GHz. On these graphs, we observed the same trends. The quartz or an acrylate laminate is always the materials with the lowest relative permittivity and the lowest dielectric loss. We can now compare the theoretical values with the experimental results. With these two examples, we see a good fit between theoretical and measured values. We thus obtain a fair dielectric characteristics of our composite laminate materials from the 2D Maxwell Garnet model. We can now retain the quartz urethane acrylate laminate, which presents relative permittivity of 3.1 and dielectric loss around 0.003 from 100 MHz to 1 GHz. At higher frequencies, the dielectric loss increased to 0.0065. This laminate is thus the most attractive one for microwave applications. In the literature, we find the quartz cyanotester laminate, which is presented at the combination, providing the lowest loss achievable from commercial off-the-self aerospace materials. At 300 MHz, this laminate has higher di dielectric loss than the quartz urethane acrylate laminate. Despite the, despite the fact that quartz cyanotester presents dielectric loss of 0.003 at 10 GHz, this nature of resins involves complex fabrications and high costs. From these discussions, we highlight the high relevance of quartz urethane acrylate laminate for low-loss load-bearing composite panel applications at microwave. 
To conclude, I presented the theoretical and experimental studies that we conduct on dielectric composite laminates at microwave. From the 2D Maxwell Garnet mixing rule, we obtained a fair theoretical dielectric characteristics. By comparison with impedance measurement results, we obtained, we obtained a good fit. After showing the dielectric performance of the quartz uretan acrylate laminate, we can conclude that uretan acrylate is a promising thermoset in resin for substrates and radomes of antennas embedded into load bearing composite panels. If you want more details about this work, please feel free to consult the article published in Composites Part C. Um, um, very nice. Um, well, uh, thank you for playing the talk. Our uh, next talk will be by Ro Rose Hinder. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, Ashes Characterization to Reduce Carbon Dioxide Emissions. And uh, Rose Hinder Chavit is from um, the Institute uh, National the, uh, Investigators Nucleus. And uh, um, well, uh, I think it's from Mexico, uh, the, the Institute is from Mexico. Well, uh, thank you. And I don't know whether our speaker uh, could uh, present uh, the slides. Could you please share your slides? I can see the speaker is here. Um, yeah. Should we wait or should I play the video? Oh, there's a video too? Yeah. Okay, sure, please, please help uh, play the video. Thank you. Okay. Good day, everybody. Right now, I am going to show you some results of the research in which the raw material were several ashes. The operation of thermal power plant with coal and or oil for, the, for electric energy production implies the generation of water vapor especially the use of carbon as fuel production, ashes name, dry fly ash, wet fly ash, and dry button ash that are byproducts of power plants and resulting from the combustion of pulverized coal. The characteristics and uses of the ash depends on the fineness, the chemical composition, and the mineralogical composition. The objective of this work is to characterize the ashes of Plutarco Elias Calles power plant as a carbon electric plant in Petacalco, state of Guerrero, Mexico, in order to determine the viability of removing CO2 from combustion gases and reducing its emissions. Among the several ashes, the silico aluminous or porcelanic ash, also known as bituminous, is not active with calcium oxide and less than 50 percentage. The most important oxides are silicium oxide, aluminum oxide, and the ferric for rows. The pH is basic and can be higher than 10. Lignite sulfate ash with a high calcium oxide content greater than 15 percentage and are called hydraulic or active. Three different techniques were used to determine the characterization of the samples. One was X-ray diffractions, the other was scanning electron microscopy, 
and the last one x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy you can see the brand of each equipment used and the specification established in the measurement in the other table you can see the particle size of the sample we prepare the micrograms of the scanning electron microscopy were taken with equipment adjusted at 20 kilovolts amplification x3000 and the reference line is 5 micrometers through a scanning electron microscopy the particle size is homogeneous of the order of 5 micrometers with a homogeneous and crystalline surface the X-ray diffraction let us identify there is a crystalline mixture with a higher context of quartz and molite, which indicates that there are bituminous ashes and with a lower content of calcite. We see more content of calcium and aluminium in dry fly ashes samples than the other two. By using photoelectron spectroscopy, calcium 2P3 is taken for the pos possible obtaining of calcium carbonate 347 electron volts. And it is observed there is a higher percentage of this compound near the main signal of calcium 2P3 and a half and calcium 2P and a half in the dry fly ashes. The content of C1S is smaller as can be seen in the high resolution spectra of calcium 2P3. The analysis of X photoelectron spectroscopy shows that the presence of calcium 1S has higher influence in the formation of calcium carbonate when it is in a lower percentage as in dry fly button excuse me dry button ashes showing that by means of the elements present in the surface of the ashes being studied. In addition, it is observed that the, the convolution, there is a shift in the main peak of calcium 2P3. This is due to the strong interaction of C1S carbon and calcium. In addition, oxygen 1S and silicium 2P are involved in those regions of energy in which calcium carbonate coexists, which is why X photoelectron spectroscopy are detected, despite the low number of accounts. In summary, the summer of calcium carbonate compound is present in the ashen as shown by, by the X-ray diffraction and EDS studies, assuming that the crystalline structure of this compound is taken and X photoelectron spectroscopy pro proves that the surface is still present and the ashes there are no calcium carbonate variations. The X-ray diffraction patterns correspond of dry fly ashes and the petacalco plant predominantly in calcium oxide. As a conclusion, we see the results shows highest percentage of calcium, oxygen, and carbon in dry fly ashes respect to the other two. Dry fly ashes is viable as a filter 
in the biogas purification process. The calcium car car carbonate compound is present in the ashes as shown by the X-ray diffraction and EDS study as crystalline structure and X photoelectron spectroscopy probe probes that this compound in the surface is still present. The authors express our gratitude to Roberto Isaac Juarez, Leticia Carapia, and Rafael Basurto for the interpretation and use of the equipment in this research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, um, our uh, speaker actually is uh, online now. Uh, however, because uh, the time is out, we would have to move on to the next talk. Uh, if you may have questions, you can uh, ask our speaker later. And now uh, I would like to ask our uh, session co-chair, Dr. Yin Huang from the University of Texas at Austin in the Material Science and Engineering Program to chair the next talk and the rest of the session. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fan, for the introduction. So next, let's welcome our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Albert Wong from the University of California, Riverside. So Dr. Wang, are you there? Uh, if not, do we have a video for this talk? Yeah, there is a video. I'm going to share it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I will give your presentation. Hello, everyone. Today I will give your presentation for the AAFM 2021 at UCLA the conference. My paper's title is Build a Whole. Amorphous IGZO PIN delt for cheap scale temperature mapping. My name is Cheng Li, who is the present, is the presenter, and I'm coming from the University of California, Riverside. Today, my presentation's online is has three parts. The first is background introduction. Next one, next part is structure and fabrication. The last part is testing performance. Now, here's the first part, the background introduction. Today, since the electronics instrument is becoming highly integrated, like our cell phones, and you can remember, you can notice that the size is becoming smaller and smaller. So we can, we can find that the heat dissipate is becoming more and more severe. However, this is not the only issue. The next, the other issue is that since the need for the cheap performance never end, never ends because the need for the, the running the large and time consuming and heavy computation task has more and more. So the heat generation is always rising. The red picture just shows the thermal map of the whole chip scales. We can find the red color stands for the hot spot and the blue color stands for the cold spot. Normally for a whole chip, the large heat generation area is always the high speed and highly computational area unit and also the RF unit. So next page just shows shows our sketch the diagram of the PN delts location within the whole chip. You can find that the gray, the gray square just stands for the whole chip and the substrate wafers. And the, and the gold, gold square just stands for the PIN delt. Because it's very small, so it can be located as many as possible and also just to put inside almost up to many places inside the chip. So we can find that it can be used as a thermal sensor, which is very necessary to be located inside the chip to monitor the temperature change. The closer the thermal sensor to the heat generation part, the more accurately we can get the temperature. 
So in order to get the complex kit distributions, we need the small size of thermal sensors, and also we need to play them in many locations that we can get the very high resolution thermal mapping heat, thermal mappings of the whole trip. Now, the next part is the structure and fabrication. The red picture also give us a cross-section of the amorphous IDZO PIN dot. We can find that the green just stands for the P heavily P-doped silicon substrate. And the the yellow part it just stands for the oxide aluminum. And the, the purple part just stands for the amorphous of IGZO just above the oxide aluminum. So the oxide aluminum just lies between the amorphous IGZO and the heavily P-doped silicon silicons, which which just used as the insulators, just as just as the PN delta, which is the I part. Now above the alpha IGZO, just we put we put the molybdenum just metals as a contact. And uh, this this all this all the structures of the alpha IGZO PN out. When testing we just uh, use a P-dope silicon as an anode and the molybdenum as a cathode. Now we, now, just we here, we just show the fabrication procedures. First, we need to have the heavily P-doped silicon wafers. Mm -hmm. Then we use photolithography to draw a mask to define the TSV shapes, which is the size is 250 micrometers multiply 130 micrometers. Remember, we use the ICPRI, which is inductively coupled plasma reactive ion etching machines to etch a very deep hole about 10 micrometers depth. And next, we use at atomic layer deposition, which is ALD deposit a thickness of 10 nanometers oxide aluminum, which is used as insulator layers. Remember, the atmosphere temperature during the reacting is only 200 Celsius. So this can make sure that this can be used to integrate into the back end of CMOS process. And uh, here one thing that we must make sure the Now next we just we just deposit the amorphous IGZO about 150 nanometer thickness. And also we want to make sure that it's covered the bolt, fully cover the bottom of the hole. And uh, this thing is, this reaction just, uh, because it just uh, happens at the room temperatures. And after that, we just use photoresist for the following lifting. And then we only get the alpha ID zero inside the hole. Next, we just also sparring the molybdenum above the alpha ID zero. Just use a thin photolithography of the mask, and after that, we just we just lifting, we just lifting the unwanted molybdenum. The molybdenum metal used as the contact materials to decrease the contact resistance before between the alpha ID zero and the probes and the probes. Here we show the board view of SEM image of the PN delt. You can see that the square part is just the board view of the PN delt and uh, and the upper layer is just the molybdenum layers but we cannot see the amorphous IGZO because it denies the, it is denies the upper layers of which is a molybdenum. Now here's the last part performance. 
Uh, for for how we construct the testing environment, here we just use a summit B series probe station combined with a Temptronic thermal truck to providing the different atmosphere temperatures. Remember that for each temperature changes, we will test it after the temperature is stable. Then we just use the Agilent Vector Signal Analyzer to set the upper limit current in case of the Large current just causes thermal breakdown of the PN out. Then we will sweep the voltage to measure the current changes under each different atmosphere temperature. You can see the figures, which just the, the IVT curves for ProTap, more for the IGZO PN out shows the good temperature sensing properties. We just gave the different temperature range rising from the 30 Celsius to 60 Celsius. Then we just sweep the voltage from 0 volts to 14 volts with the current components 1 milliamperes. So with the temperature rising, the current will increase for a fixed voltage. And with the temperature increasing, the voltage will decrease at a fixed current. So this is a good temperature sensing properties because because for the H fixed temperature fixed current or voltage, the, the voltage or current will change more monotonously. So this property just gave a good good temperature sensing property. This is all about our just paper content. If you have any questions, you can just send an email to to me and I will answer it. So thank you everyone. And uh, hope you have a good, hope you have a good day and uh, hope you can enjoy the conference. So bye. Okay, uh, let's stop here. Uh, so, uh, our next speaker is Mohammed Abdelspor Farmi from the Ramon University College. So, uh, Mohammed, are you here? Uh, if his, if the speaker is not here, uh, she can you help to play the video? Uh, yes, uh, I will play it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Our paper title Boundary Element Thermomechanical Modeling of Fractional Order Nonlinear Dual Phase Lag by Heat Transfer Problems and Functionally Graded on Isotropic Viscoelastic Soft Tissue. The main objective of this paper is to contribute for increasing the development of biocomposite applications according to our boundary element modeling for, descri for describing thermomechanical interactions and functionally graded anisotropic viscoelastic soft tissues. The governing equations of current model are briefly presented, including the time fractional order nonlinear dual phase lag by heat transfer model and biotis model. These highly complex governing equations are solved using the boundary element method which is a versatile and strong method since it deals with more complex viscoelastic soft tissue shapes and doesn't require the discretization of the interior domain. Also, it has low RAM and CPU utilization. The general boundary element method based on local radial function collection method has been used for solving the time fractional order nonlinear dual phase lag by heat transfer model then the displacement and the stress distributions can be achieved by solving the mechanical equation using the convolution quadrature boundary element method numerical results demonstrate the validity efficiency and accuracy of our proposed modeling technique right, in the introduction human body is a complicated thermal structure are seen the survival and cloud burner have been proved that the temperature difference between arterial blood and the venous blood is due to oxygenization of blood. An important number of research papers in bioheat transfer over the past few decades has focused on an understanding of blood flow effect on the temperature distribution within living biological tissues. 
the first attempt to describe the temperature distribution in biological tissues with blood flow effect has been introduced by Benis, Ascarizada, and Amadikia. Solved analytically Fourier and non Fourier bioheat equations. In skin tissue, Lee, uh, reference number four, established the biothermomechanical behavior in bilayer bi the human skin. Due to non linearity of bioheat equations, it is really difficult to solve them analytically. In general, therefore, uh, many researchers have used and applied various numerical methods like finite difference method, finite element method, and boundary element method. The boundary element method is one of the numerical methods used to solve the current general problem. Generally, Laplace domain fundamental solutions are easier to obtain than time domain fundamental solutions for engineering and scientific problems. Since the convolution quadrature boundary element method requires Laplace domain fundamental solution of the problems governing equations and didn't need unknown time domain fundamental solutions. Therefore, it is widely used and significant in scientific and engineering applications. Formation of the problem, the governing equation that models the biothermomechanical behavior of anisotropic biological tissues can be expressed as Equations 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Implementation for bioheat transfer field of the problem. The three dimensional bioheat transfer equation expressed by the following dual phase lag model. Equation 6. In the, and the boundary and initial boundary conditions uh, 7. Discretizing the time interval into f plus one equal time steps delta t with discrete times thus equation six can be written in the system eight which can be expressed in equation nine According to the boundary element technique of Liao, reference 67, we can extend the technique to deal with three dimension dual phase lag by heat transfer equation by considering the following partial differential equations for phi, equation 10, 11, and 12. In order to obtain U, we follow the following iterative rules, reference 68, equation 13, now we use boundary element technique for each transition to solve equation 40. The boundary integral equation for 14 as a reference 62 equation 15, which can be expressed in equation 60. Equation 60 can be approximated as follows equation 17. Using the boundary conditions into 17, we obtain the unknowns W and U on the boundary. Then the values U can be calculated as follows. Equation 80. Boundary element implementation for the both elastic media. The representation formula for problem 7, which describes the unknown field U inside the domain, equation 19, where the integral operators are equation 80, 20, and 21. The fundamental solution and the attraction as a reference 65 was written in equation 22, where the solid displacement fundamental solution us can be expressed as an equation 23 which can be expressed as in reference 61 as an equation 24. for the regularization the displacement fundamental solution for solid is dismantled into singular and regular parts respectively as an equation 
25. Now the Laplace domain boundary integral equation can be expressed at equation 26. Apply inverse Laplace transformation to obtain the following boundary integral equation 27 according to reference 65 borrow elastodynamic fundamental solution can be expressed as an equation 28 by applying the procedure in reference 70 to the convolution operator of our problem 27 we obtain equation 29 which can be expressed at equation 30 Where the unknown Newman datum is approximated with I continuous polynomial shape functions and the time dependent coefficients, also the unknown Dirichlet datum is approximated with Gabe's wise discontinuous polynomial shape function of psi and the time dependent coefficients as full. Equation 33 and 34. Inserting these special shape functions into 30 equation yield the following. Algebraic system of equations, and we obtained the unknowns. Numerical results this is the geometry of our problems and this boundary element of our model. Variation of the biothermal stress was time for different graded values. Uh, this m equals zero corresponding to homogeneous homogeneous case m equal 0 0.3 0 0.6 0 0.9 corresponding to graded parameters or functional graded material also here this black means homogeneous and this is for Functionally graded material, graded parameter 0.3, graded parameter 0.6, 0.9. Also here, black for homogeneous case and this other case for functionally graded materials. In order to verify our results and our technique, we compare our okay since we are already behind our schedule let's stop here and uh, seems like our next speaker uh lucas Ferreira, is not here so she would you please also play the video Uh, Qi, can you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm working on it just a second. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, it seems like uh, Muhammad is here. So if you have questions about the previous talk, please just uh, uh, test him. Yeah. Yeah, right now we have to move on. Hello everyone, my name is Lucas Ferreira. I'm from the Pontifico Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and I'll present my work entitled Effect of Dimensional Parameters on the Mechanical Behavior of Curved Beam by Stable Mechanisms. My advisor, José Roberto Moraes Almeida, also participated in this work. This is the summary of the presentation. First, uh, I'll do an introduction on compliant mechanisms, by stable mechanisms, and the objectives of this work. Then I'll talk about the analysis part, where I'll show the analytical and numerical methods that I use to simulate the mechanism. And then I'll show the results of the variation of the mechanism's parameters that we obtained. And finally, the conclusions and references. Compliant mechanisms generate motion by the deflection of flexible members. On the other hand, traditional mechanisms are composed of rigid parts that are co connected by pins and joints to generate motion. 
Here on the left, there is a picture of the difference between these mechanisms, where on the top the traditional mechanism has several pins and joints, and it's composed of at least 10 parts, and on the bottom the compliant mechanism is a single 3D printed structure, and they dev develop the same task. Here on the right, there is another printed uh, compliant mechanism that rotates, and some advantages of them are no need to lubrication, fewer parts, cheaper, less stocking, and easier manufacturing. And the disadvantages are related to project complexity, fatigue, and limited movement. Bistable mechanisms are a type of compliant mechanism that have two stable positions. And on these two images here, there is an example of one developed by Correa in the University of Texas. It is composed of curved beams here. And when they are compressed, they go to a different stable position as shown in this image here. The first image uh, shows the process that the beams are submitted, a force is applied, and then they snap through to the second stable position. The objective of this work is to better understand how the variation of the mechanism parameters affects the force displacement behavior, and what parameters affect the bistability condition of the mechanism. Not much work has been found in the literature concerning the in-depth study of these parameters, so this is the motivation of this work. Here, uh, it's the mechanism used in this work, and it's a simpler version of the complete mechanism shown here. It was reduced to decrease processing time and to make the modeling easier. Uh, two curved beams are connected by their center, and this is important because in that way the mechanism can be bistable. If only one curved beam was present, it would not be possible. But I'll, I'll explain that better on the following slides. The mechanisms can be monostable or bistable, depending on the parameters. And the parameters that I'll talk about here are the side length here, thickness of the curved beam, beam span, uh, which is the length here, and the apex height. The analytical formulation of a curved beam bistable mechanism, mechanism was developed by Q et al. And they found out that if a single curved beam is used, then it could not be bistable. This is better explained by these curves and these equations. I'll not have enough time to discuss it in depth, but what is important is that for a double curved beam, the force dis displacement relationship follows the F1 and F3, F3 relationships shown here, and they are related to the first and third modes of buckling. If it was a single beam, it will follow the first, the F1 and F2 but F2 would prevent its bistability. The chained beam constraint model, or CBCM, is a numerical method that can be used to model curved beams. In sum, it breaks the beam into several pieces, and based on the values of the displacements, it returns the forces and moments. So you can generate a force displacement relationship, and in this work we use CBCM to model the mechanisms with and without the side length. The finite element analysis uh, was performed in Abacus with a mesh size of 0.5 millimeters, fixed supports at the ends, roller supports on the bottom surface and on the center to prevent rotation of that part, and the displacement boundary condition at the top of two times the apex height here, which is the maximum displacement allowed by the mechanism. And the static rigs analysis was chosen to model the simulation once it deals better with these types of buckling behavior. As only simulated experiments were conducted, we used the data of properties of a high density polyethylene that was provided by Pereira et al. Pereira 2019, who is a doctoral student of our uh, research group. Uh, the Young's modulus was 947 megapascal, density of 950 kilograms per cubic meter, and Poisson's ratio of 0 0.39. So the first parameter we studied was the side length here, once it's rarely discussed in the literature. So to sum up, when the side length gets better, the force threshold gets smaller, and the force of the valley gets bigger. As we can see here in the first image, the mechanism with side length of 5 and 20 millimeters have force in the value higher and the maximum force is getting lower. And the second point is that uh, a bistable mechanism can become monostable depends on the value 
of the side length. As we can see here, the mechanism with no side length was bistable once it reached a level of negative force. And when I increase the side length, it's getting close to a zero force value, becoming marginally bistable. And an interesting result is that the absorbed energy of the mechanisms with side length is similar and only the forces changes. The decrease of force threshold is compensated by the increase of the force valley of the valley. Uh, so now talking about the beam spin, the effect of the side length is more noticeable in mechanisms with higher lambda over L ratio. As we can see here, after the value of 0.10 of the ratio, the force threshold of the mechanism begins to diverge from the expected numerical result of the CBCM. And this distance is more evident in mechanisms with lower beam span, as we can see here. And for higher values of the beam span, the force threshold gets smaller and less energy is absorbed, as we can see here. And finally, the last analyzed parameter is the apex height. The value Q is the ratio between the apex height and the thickness of the beam and is related to the bistability condition. The criti critical value of Q also depends on the beam span. And here it's a figure showing the analysis of 108 mechanisms with three values of side length, 0 mm, 5 mm and 20 mm. And the mechanisms had varied apex height and the, fix, and the thickness of the beam was fixed at 1 mm. Here, a good number of uh, mechanisms were bistable, as we can see by the colored squares. And the left column here is the normalized energy absorbed, and the right one is the normalized energy cost, which is the energy that the mechanisms must spend to leave the bistability position. And when we compare with these, these other two values of side length, we can better understand the effect of the side length. Only these mechanisms are bistable with 20 millimeters. We can see a difference from this image to this image. And with no side length, the critical value of Q is 2.5 here. And with two, uh, 20 millimeters, the, the value is 2.8. Finally, we concluded that the side length affects directly the bistability potential of a mechanism. High values of beam span reduce the energy absorbed of the mechanism. The apex height of the thickness have an important role on bistability, which is represented by the ratio Q. Once the critical Q value changes, uh, with the beam span. Okay, so uh, since we are already behind our schedule. So uh, our next speaker will be Christina Ivo, uh, Ivanova. Uh, Christina, are you, are you there? Uh, seem like, seems like uh, she is probably not here. Okay, Chi, would you please play the video instead? <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Christina. Today I'm going to present our work entitled Nano-enabled multi-layer coatings with switchable bacterial killing activities for prevention of catheter-related infections. So first, I would like to say some uh, facts uh, about uh, bacterial infections and the development of antimicrobial resistance. So antimicrobial uh, resistant uh, Infections are the greatest challenges of the 21st century, being responsible for 700,000 deaths annually and expected to reach almost 10 million deaths and 1,000 trillion fina financial loss by 2050. Uh, more than uh, 490,000 new antimicrobial resistant bacteria appear every year and up to 3 million people per year acquire antimicrobial resistant infections during their stay in a hospital. So another concern is that uh, uh, only 30% of the developing countries have uh, plans against uh, antimicrobial resistant development. So the question is how uh, bacteria resist the antibiotic actions. So within the, the use of uh, 
antibiotics, bacteria develop uh, very sophisticated mechanisms to survive the uh, antibiotics therapies. So they produce different uh, enzymes to alter or degrade the antibiotic or express efflux pumps to transport out of the cells the drug. This is what we call uh, individual resistance of free floating uh, bacterial cells. What is more concerning is the so called collective resistance when bacteria form biofilms, which are a complex community of cells protected from the hostile environment by self produced extracellular polymeric matrix. So these biofilms are 100 times more resistant to uh, drugs. Uh, than the free floating bacterial cells. So, anti, uh, uh, antibiotic resistant biofilms may be formed on living surfaces, including lungs, wounds, teeth, causing difficult to treat uh, infections, or they may form on non living surfaces as implants and indwelling medical devices, for example, catheters. Uh, actually, more than 40% uh, percent of all hospital acquired infections are catheter related, and 80% percent of all infections on the urinary tract are due to catheterization. So, uh, current strategies uh, as frequent uh, uh, replacement of the device and aggressive antibiotic uh, therapies are only a short, short term solution associated uh, with uh, side effects as hypersensitivity, inflammation, and so on. And um, in this work, actually, we aim to develop uh, innovative um, solution to inhibit bacterial growth and biofilm formation on catheter surfaces. So our approach consists of engineering cell defensive coatings of nanoparticles, which have shown enhanced antibacterial activity than the free counterparts uh, due to the better interaction with bacterial membrane and uh, easy access to the target site. The combination of these nanoparticles with uh, uh, poro quenching enzyme such as acylase, uh, which are able to disrupt bacterial cell to cell communication and prevent the biofilm formation on the surfaces, is expected to uh, demonstrate even higher uh, antimicrobial efficacy than the, uh, the, than the individual uh, approaches. So the main advantage of this combined uh, uh, strategy uh, containing nanoparticles and quorum quenching enzymes uh, uh, has, has several uh, advantages, uh, advantages uh, avoids the time and resource uh, consuming for screening for new antimicrobials. Um, uh, there is a low risk of resistance development uh, due to the different mechanisms of antimicrobial actions, mainly uh, membrane uh, disruptions and uh, disruption and quorum sensing inhibition. So uh, at the beginning, uh, we developed hybrid uh, silver lignin nanoparticles uh, using lignin as both uh, uh, reducing and capping agent. So the developed nanoparticle had uh, high colloidal stability. Their zeta potential was uh, above 30. They also presented small size, uh, which is around 50 nanometer, nanometers, even lower, and uh, low polydispersity uh, index. Importantly, uh, silver linear nanoparticles were very efficient against a panel of susceptible and multi-drug resistant pathogens, which were uh, isolated from uh, which were uh, which are isolated from uh, clinical uh, hospital environment and uh, this effect actually was uh, not seen for the stand alone silver nanoparticles which clearly demonstrate that the developed silver linear nanoparticles uh, possess a great potential to find uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria so on the next slide you can see uh, how these nanoparticles interact with different uh, bacterial strain, strains. We tested their uh, uh, ability to inhibit the, uh, their, their interaction with um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Sinetobacter baumani, and Staphylococcus um, aureus. 
So on the images, there, the, on, upon the interaction of the nanoparticles, uh, the cells uh, demonstrated uh, cellular uh, damage, including disruption of the cell membrane integration and loss of cytoplasmic content. Moreover, some of the nanoparticles were found in the cytoplasmic space. Uh, which indicates the ability of those nanoparticles to penetrate the membrane and affect essential uh, life-supporting metabolic uh, processes in uh, bacteria. So these uh, antibacterial nanoparticles were further uh, assembled uh, with antibiofilm anti-infective core quenching acylase and bacteria-degradable uh, elastin in stable nano-enabled uh, catheter coatings for a triggered uh, killing of Pseudomonas aerogenosa. Different number of oppositely charged layers were uh, uh, assembled of silicon catheters in a layer by layer fashion, fashion and their antibacterial activity was further assessed. So what we found is that uh, increasing the number of layers and consequently the amount of nanoparticles in the coating does not uh, improve the killing effect when uh, of, of, of our materials when they're exposed to Pseudomonas aerogenosa, which is a common pathogen found in catheter-associated uh, urinary tract infections. So this hybrid uh, silver lignin nano uh, coatings, nano-enabled coatings, developed uh, after 10 sequential deposition uh, step of uh, four and a half billiards as here, as demonstrated here, uh, reduce the growth by, uh, uh, of bacteria by more than three logs and therefore were subjected to further, uh, to further uh, analysis. So, uh, the selected hybrid coatings actually were able to inhibit the Pseudomonas aerogenosa biofilm growth as was confirmed after a live biofilm uh, cells uh, counting and microscopic visualization of the uh, biofilm after staining with live dead kit, uh, cells viability kit. So uh, all the, uh, which, uh, uh, the, uh, and the, 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 the results were better for the hybrid uh, coatings uh, when compared to the individual coatings. A part of that, uh, this, uh, the, the multi-layers were 100% biocompatible to skin fibroblast and keratinocytes. All the cells that were uh, exposed to the coatings or were placed in a, coat, uh, in a contact with those coatings for more for up to seven days uh, uh, were live. This was confirmed by Alamar Blue assay and did not present any changes uh, in their uh, morphology in comparison to the pristine silicone. So finally, to summarize the most important outcomes of our work, the work was uh, supported uh, the uh, hybrid silver linking nanoparticles obtained by environmentally friendly reduction of, of uh, silver ions to met metallic silver with lignin demonstrated strong antibacterial activity against susceptible and multiple drug resistant bacteria. Hybrid uh, silver lignin nanoparticles and quorum quenching enzyme acylase were sequentially assembled with bacteria degradable elastin, producing multilayers with switchable killing activities. Okay, uh, let's stop here. And uh, our next speaker will be Swami Nathan K from the National Institute of Technology, uh, Kanataka. Uh, if if the speaker is here, please turn on your video and start sharing the screen. Uh, oh, I, I don't have the video for the speaker. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. we probably uh, have a a later break. Then we will start start our next talk on uh, two twenty p.m. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
this. So our next speaker will be Tobias Scadler from the HRL Laboratories of United States of America. Of America. Uh, so this speaker here. So if not, let's uh, play the video. And Hello, my name is Katya Stankovic, and today I'll be presenting on additive manufacturing of polymer-derived ceramic matrix composites. For the motivation for this work, um, ceramics offer properties that cannot be achieved by metals or polymers. 
This includes high temperature capabilities, great corrosion resistance, and wear resistant for applications like propulsion, hypersonics, and chemical processing. However, manufacturing these ceramic parts is quite challenging. Um, bulk ceramics cannot be cast or molded like metals and are hard to machine, therefore strongly limiting their part geometries. Sintering ceramic powders can be done, but it results in brittle parts with low toughness. Ceramic matrix composites alleviate the toughness and brittleness problem, but they are very costly to manufacture. Therefore, this is the perfect space for additive manufacturing to change the game. Additive manufacturing enables a cost-efficient method to fabricate complex parts with the unique properties of ceramics for a wide range of these applications. In the next slides, I will go into more detail about the methods and innovation that our group at HRL Laboratories has used to enable 3D printing of ceramic matrix composites. For some background, there are certain silicon-based polymers that can undergo pyrolysis and crystallization to form crystalline ceramics. These are the polymer-derived ceramics. This type of ceramic forming method has been around for about 50 years and is widely used today to make ceramic fibers and ceramic matrix composites. Up until recently, these polymers have only been able to be cured through thermal curing, so the geometries available are limited. Our team's innovation at HRL Laboratories has enabled the use of these pre-ceramic polymers to be used in commercially available 3D printers. When you add a UV functional group to the pre-ceramic polymer, you're able to facilitate cross-linking through UV curing as opposed to thermal curing. This UV functional pre-ceramic polymer can then be used in sterile lithography and digital light processing systems to make polymer parts in a wide range of geometries. You then take that polymer part, pyrolyze it, and it will yield a fully ceramic part. We use this pre-ceramic polymer as an active binder in our 3D printer. In an active binder approach, the printed pre-ceramic polymer undergoes direct conversion from polymer to ceramic via pyrolysis. This is different from more conventional passive binder 3D printing. With a passive binder, a ceramic particle suspension is used in an organic UV curable polymer to create the part. After the part is printed, the binder is removed and the remaining ceramic particles are sintered together. The process is often very lengthy and leaves residual porosity in the part. The benefit to using our pre-ceramic polymer as an active binder is it facilitates the use of ceramic reinforcements to toughen the ceramic matrix. The use of secondary reinforcements in ceramics is a well-studied mechanism to increase the fracture toughness of the ceramic material. There are a number of known toughening mechanisms that can be employed to increase fracture toughness of ceramics. The two that we've been studying for our additively manufactured ceramics is particle reinforcement and whisker reinforcement. Currently, our most mature pre-ceramic polymer yields silicon oxycarbide with a K1C toughness value of about one MPa root meter without any secondary reinforcements. By optimizing the matrix and reinforcements used in our pre-ceramic polymer system, toughness values beyond conventional ceramics should be achievable using our 3D printed CMC. In order to reinforce our silicon oxycarbide pre-ceramic resin, the cure behavior of the polymer needs to be determined. For the resins that we formulate, we determine the photopolymerization behavior by fitting to Jacob's equation. As you can see from the plot, the unreinforced pre-ceramic resin has the highest cure depth. When you put reinforcements into the resin system, although the base resin hasn't changed, the cure behavior deviates from the unfilled material. This is because there is light absorption and scattering occurring due to the particle addition. So although silicon carbide whisker reinforcements would give us the theoretically higher toughness values than particle reinforcement, the cure depth is hindered since silicon carbide absorbs so much of the UV light. This is why we chose to examine particle reinforcements like alumina and molite first. 
Here's one of our first attempts at particle reinforcements using alumina particles. On the left is a micrograph of a polished surface of our reinforced silicon oxycarbide after it's been printed and pyrolyzed. So even in our first attempts, we see the toughening mechanisms described earlier coming into effect. From the edge of the hardness indent, you can see there's geometric shielding where the secondary particle reinforcement causes the crack initiated to propagate and get deflected along a more torturous path to increase the toughness of the silicon oxycarbide material. So we have crack tip deflection observed in our particle reinforced additively manufactured silicon oxycarbide. Next, now that we've observed that crack tip deflection is possible with particle reinforcements. We did a more in-depth study using molite particles at different volume fraction loadings. We did single edge notched bend tests to quantify the amount of toughening occurring in our composite material. Particulate reinforcement increased toughness of our silicon oxycarbide ceramic by about 2x with a peak at 10 volume percent molate. This peak toughness at around 3.5 MPa root meter is close to toughness values seen in silicon carbide and alumina, showing that our additively manufactured CMC can achieve values close to technical ceramics. To push that toughness even higher, we use silicon carbide whisker reinforcements in our silicon oxycarbide matrix. Toughening through fiber pullout and bridging is shown here to increase our CMC toughness up to around 4.5 MPA root meter. In this toughening mechanism, whiskers remain intact behind a passing crack in the matrix, providing a bridge that closes the crack. While these preliminary results are promising, more work is needed to control the orientation and dispersion of the whiskers within the matrix, as well as potential surface treatments to the whiskers to promote better pullout and higher toughening. Through this work in additive manufacturing, our group had a NASA tipping point program for small launch vehicles. In this program, we were tasked with 3D printing ceramic rocket engine nozzles for the second stage of small sat launch vehicles. The benefit of 3D printing these parts include lower cost to fabricate, shorter lead times, and incorporation of higher complexity in the part geometry. So in conclusion, we've demonstrated 3D printing of ceramics from pre-ceramic monomers. We also use second phase particle and whisker reinforcements to improve toughness of our 3D printed ceramic. The toughness values that we saw are on par with toughness of technical ceramics. Our funding was provided by the NASA Tipping Point Program and HRL Laboratories. And this work was published last year as a cover story in the Journal of the American Ceramic Society. Okay, a very nice talk. Uh, then our next, uh, uh, since it's a video, we cannot ask a question now, but if you are interested, you can email the authors. Um, so our next uh, speaker will be uh, Julio Bastos, Arieta, uh, and the talk will be bacterial bolts, motile cells, biological carriers of novel nano antimicrobial activities. So, uh, Julio, is, uh, if you are here, please uh, start sharing the screen. Okay, uh, otherwise, do we have the video? Yeah, we have the video. I will get it yeah. started. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work entitled Bacteria Bots, Motile Stealth Biological Carriers of Novel Nanoactives. There are different active systems in our surroundings, like group of birds, fish, particles, animations that we have seen even in video games. Active systems, and specifically active colloid systems, are the ones capable of converting energy from the near environment into movement. These active systems are classified into, firstly, the artificial microswimmers, 
with a mean of sample of Janus particles. Janus particles have an asymmetry due to different chemical composition or physical properties. That leads to a gradient towards a specific stimuli, like the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, and then moving because of this gradient. On the other hand, we have the biological microswimmers, like bacteria, sperm cells, and molecular motors. These have the ability to swim through different chemical or metabolic reactions, or even physical interactions. I will focus on this type of biological systems as movement actuators in this presentation. In this sense, bacterial biohybrid microswimmers takes advantage of bacteria cap capability to swim in order to develop microtransportation systems, composed by a carrier, in this case the bacteria, and an inorganic particle, a cargo, that is considered like a container for further functionalities. Examples of biohybrids are shown here, like the sperm bots and the bacteria bots. The bacteria bots themselves uh, can be further classified in terms of the ratio between carrier and cargo. So we have the bacteria bots, we have the multibot, or we have the bacterial microsystem, depending on this ratio. Beyond this, we have the, the intrinsic differences among bacteria and the inorganic particles. For example, we have the electrical double layer or the surface charge of the particles and bacteria, which influences the interaction with the surrounding ions. This feature is quite important for the efficient development of bacteria. Inorganic particles are more tunable, predictable, and mostly homogeneous in their chemical composition or the chemical moieties on the surface, and that's why the interaction with ions is quite known. But with bacteria, it's the other way around. Its surface is quite complex, it's more dynamic, and it's not homogeneous as the inorganic particles. So we take all these features into account in order to develop different strategies, attachment strategies for the assembly of bacteria bots. These are based on chemical bonding interaction, electrostatic, roughness, hardness, the slime produced by the bacteria themselves, or even hydrophobic interactions. It, there, everything of these, uh, all of these strategies uh, are aimed to develop in perspective transportation systems with relevance in fields like the nanomedicine. We focus in the development of bacteria bots, of bacteria bots using non-pathogenic bacteria, like the ones part of our own uh, microbiome. Besuptilis or Bacillus subtilis is a visible carrier. It's a gram-positive bacteria. Uh, when we describe the swimming behavior, it has long curved trajectories. It's non-pathogenic, as I've said before. Uh, the set of potential is minus 25 millivolts, which uh, gives the idea that interaction with positive surfaces is uh, quite good. And uh, it's grown in nutrient growth agar, uh, but this contains uh, or implies high ionic strength. We studied the similar behavior considering this ion strength uh, content on the, med in the medium, and as well the cargo, the possible cargo attachment to the uh, substrate. Um, as I've said before, this bacteria grow in a high ion strength medium, but this will lead to cargo attachment to the substrate of analysis instead of to the bacteria. This is needed to be uh, considered uh, or to develop in between conditions in order to obtain an efficient attachment. So, uh, different solutions with different ion strength were prepared uh, in order to resuspend Bacillus subtilis and evaluate their swimming behavior. In this case, uh, phosphate buffer solution, water medium in ratio 1 1, and sodium chlorine 0 0.1 mole per liter were studied. In order to, con to characterize the movement of bacteria, firstly, we analyze the raw conditions in the growing medium. Different videos were recorded under these conditions to obtain significant amount of velocity trajectories and values. Firstly, there was image treatment uh, performed using ImageJ software to detect automatically the bacteria cell swimming, and then to obtain the corresponding swimming tracks. An average value of 35.2 microns per second was observed and calculated for this bacteria. Accordingly, 
for further evaluations, we carried out this uh, consideration for the other solutions that we mentioned before, and the bacteria were suspended on them, and as it, can, as it can be seen, there is a decrease in the average velocity of the bacteria, as it was expected. But the one value closer to the raw bacteria is the one in the suspension 1-1 one, one to water and medium with a 25.3 microns per second. Um, so this value was chosen as medium for the binding assays. Evaluating the affinity, uh, the attachment affinity towards Bacillus subtilis as a carrier can be carried out using quartz microbalance technique. In this, the binding rate and the binding to a quartz crystal is screened by the difference oscillation frequency. Then the crystal is functionalized in this case with polylysine to obtain positive charge and then to evaluate its attachment or its interaction with uh, different bacteria cells, in this case Bacillus, Bacillus subtilis. As it can, can be seen, uh, the functionalized crystal presented higher oscillation difference respect to the non-modified crystal, which shows that this is a favorable interaction for the attachment of Bacillus subtilis. This approach can be used for the evaluation of further functionalities for the assembly of cargo to bacteria. Then, polylysine was used to functionalize mesoporous particles, mesoporous silica particles. These particles are, were chosen because you can easily functionalize them with different chemical um, strategies. They are biocompatible and then can be loaded with further actives. The effective functionalization of the mesoporous silica particles were evaluated as well with um, the difference in between the zeta potential before and after the functionalization to obtain a change uh, previously from minus 39 millivolts to plus 20 millivolts. Then, after the incubation of these particles with the conditions previously mentioned, uh, it was observed different cases of attachment of this swimming on the swimming of bacteria, therefore the assembly of bacteria bots. Different swimming tracks were estimated as well as the ones uh, shown in this image with an average velocity around 19.1 microns per second uh, for these systems. Even though the velocity is compromised a little, a little the assembled bacteria bots are capable to transport effectively the cargo, uh, in this case, the silica particles loaded with uh, polylysine. Overall, the conclusions and perspectives of this work, let's say uh, take home messages are, for example, the carrier characterization implies the swimming behavior that we did with optical uh, microscopy to obtain the best conditions for the binding assays. This binding affinity can be screened with a uh, quartz crystal microbalance approach, uh, and then new uh, approaches and functionalities can be tested in this, in this sense by this technique. Using the QCM data, uh, this can be adapted accordingly to functionalize particles, and is used as well as, as, in this case, screened by the change of set of potential. Then uh, the effective assembly of bacteria was, was observed and studied by the optical microscopy and as well by the evaluation of the uh, swimming tracks in between the particles uh, binded to the bacteria. And as a future perspective, these studies open the gate for the development of new nanoactives or multifunctional cargo once the assembly procedures to the main body, in this case, the silica, the mesoporous silica particles, is optimized. Uh, once again, I, I would like to thank for the opportunity of presenting this promising works, work in this conference and thank you all for your interest. Okay, uh, seems like we are just about time. So our uh, next speaker will be Han Liu from the UCLA. Um, Han, I see you. Uh, are you there? Yes, yes. Yeah, Thanks please for... start to uh, share your screen. Uh, yes, I have a video. Okay. Do you, want, do you want to play the video or uh, give yes. a... Okay. Uh, you can play the video, yeah. Okay, okay I'll play it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hello everyone, thanks for your coming. My name is Han Liu, a PhD student from Paris Lab at UCLA, advised by Professor Mashu Baoji. Today, I'm going to present one of my recent works related to combining computational simulations and machine learning to accelerate materials inverse design. And here, specifically, I'm going to present the de novo prediction of disordered mechanical metal materials by machine learning. The first question is, what is mechanical metal material? We usually use this term to highlight the materials exhibiting exceptional mechanical properties. One example is light yet stiff cellular materials. Depending on their structure, cellular materials can exhibit various density stiffness scaling laws. As illustrated in this figure, the Young's modulus decreases upon decreasing density and shows a power law dependence on its, uh, on its uh, density, where the density stiffness scaling exponent n depends on the structural pattern. In practice, a small exponent structure such as octact truss it's promising to prepare light yet stiff materials. Up to date, most existing mechanical metal materials rely on crystalline structures. It has been revealed that upon axial loading of ordered metal materials, structures exhibiting bound stretching dominated response favor small exponent n while structures exhibiting bound bending dominated response result in larger exponent n. For ordered metal materials, the pattern of crystalline networks offers a primary degree of freedom to twin mechanical behaviors. In contrast to ordered metal materials, we extend the concept of metal materials to disordered structures. That is, instead of solely relying on crystalline patterns, we expect structural disorder could offer a potential additional degree of freedom to twin mechanical behaviors of metal materials. And we aim to discover new disordered mechanical metal materials with tailored uh, mechanical behaviors using machine learning. Rather than directly optimizing the structure of disordered metal materials, we use machine learning to optimize an, an underlying force field that indirectly governs structure. Here, I select a three-body force field where the two-body radial induction is fixed. I investigate the influence of three-body angular interactions on the structure and property of the disordered network. As a primary goal, I expect machine learning would predict an optimal force field that produces disordered metal structures exhibiting small density uh, stiffness scaling exponent n. These figures illustrate the force field I used. The left figure is the fixed two-body radial induction. The right two figures represent the tunable three-body angular inductions. Overall, the force field has three tunable angular parameters. That is, the preferred band angle theta naught the relative intensity lambda over A, and the intensity parameter gamma. Given an underlying force field, I prepared a disorder structures using molecular dynamic simulations. That is, starting from a random initial structure, I conduct simulated alleling with the imposed force field and the MPT ensemble. The final structure is a disordered porous network governed by the force field. 
For each of those spells, I prepare a series of disorder structures at different packing densities and assess the densities differently scaling coefficient n for the force field. The Young's modulus of each configuration is computed by molecular dynamic simulations, and I fit all pairs of Young's modulus and density for the series of configurations to obtain the exponent n for the force field. Our goal is to use machine learning to find the force field with minimum exponent n. The machine learning method I used is an um, iterative active learning based on Gaussian process regression and Bayesian optimization. This figure shows an illustration of Gaussian process regression. The y-axis is exponent n, x-axis is a force field parameter theta naught. And for illustration purpose, the other force field parameters are fixed. By interpolating the known points, Gaussian process regression offers not only a prediction curve, but also its uncertainty. Then Bayesian optimization predicts the next, next position that is most promising to find the minimum exponent n. Since the global minimum is most likely to locate in the area, either near current predicted minimum or locate in the area with high uncertainty. Bayesian optimization offers the best trade-off position that best balances the exploitation of current predicted minimum and the exploration of high uncertainty areas. We then calculate the exponent n at the best trade-off position and add this point to the known points. Using the updated known points, we update a Gaussian process regression and use Bayesian optimization to predict the next promising minimum position. This process will iterate until the best trade-off position converges to the true global minimum. Using this machine learning approach, I expect an optimal first field can be identified that exhibits minimum exponent n. We now look at the machine learning process to discover a disorder structure with minimum exponent n. During this search, several competitive force fields with minimum exponent n have been identified, where the global minimum force field shows an exponent n equal to 1.09, approaching the theoretical minimum n of, the, of mechanical metal materials, that is n equal to 1. We now investigate the structural features shared by these small n structures identified by machine learning. Figure A and B provides, provide some examples of small n structures and large n structures, respectively. We find that random 3D polyhedron packing is more likely to yield small n structures than random 1D or 2D structure packing. Figure D and E shows the exponent n as a function of the tunable three-body force-field parameters. We find that the regions exhibiting high exponent n are regions associated with strong three-body inductions, where the bound directionality is very high to prevent random 3D polyhedron packing. Instead, we find, we find that moderate bound directionality will contribute to the formation of small n structures. Finally, I investigate the mechanism that governs the exponent n in disordered matter materials. Upon exit loading, I find the minimum exponent network shows higher normal stress 
but lowers. Okay, so due to the time, we have to stop here. And uh, if okay. you have questions, uh, we have Han here. You can just uh, text message him. Okay, let's move on Thanks. to our uh, next speaker, uh, which is Tasnia uh, Tasnia Ahmed from the Military Institute of Science and Technology, uh, Bangladesh People's Republic of. Okay, so uh, I think uh, Tasnia prefer to play the video. So she would you please play the video? Sure, I, I'm going to play it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I am Tasnia Ahmed. I have completed my undergraduate degree in civil engineering from Military Institute of Science and Technology, Bangladesh. It is one of the top ranked engineering university of Bangladesh providing quality education in the field of science, engineering and technology and conduct research to meet the national and global challenges. Today I am going to present my research titled Dynamic behavior of carbon galvanized iron and glass textile reinforced concrete subjected to impact loading. The other authors of this research are Dr. Muhammad Jahidul Islam, Sheikh Muhammad Fahad bin Imam, and Muhammad Ifaz. I'm going to proceed with my presentation. Textile reinforced concrete or TRC is a type of high strength concrete reinforced with textiles of fibers such as glass fiber, GI fiber, carbon fiber, etc. combining the advantages of fiber reinforced concrete and ordinary reinforced concrete. Alternative reinforcement materials have been searched since steel is susceptible to corrosion. TRC could be a better solution in replacing conventional reinforced concrete systems in various fields. In this presentation, I'm going to cover background of the study, objectives, research methodology, test results and discussion, and conclusion. We gather some knowledge and information from the previous researches conducted on TRC. TRC structures have less thickness than steel reinforced concrete, so it is more economical due to lesser raw materials. They appear to be 30% more environment friendly compared to ordinary RC systems. Carbon fiber textiles show better performance in TRCs than any other textiles, but as it is much expensive, $1.3 per square feet, GI fiber textiles can be an option as it is less expensive, $0.70 cents per square feet. It can be a new improvement if GI fiber textiles can show similar performance as carbon fiber textiles. TRC is used for retrofitting and architectural works. It is also used to make some food structures like food bridges, small cottages, etc. It creates different irregular shapes which is very difficult by RC systems. The objective of our research was to investigate the dynamic behavior of carbon galvanized iron and glass textile reinforced concrete against impact loading. In the research methodology section, I'm going to cover the materials used in sample preparation, textile reinforcements, mixed design, sample preparation process, and experimental setup. Two types of samples were prepared that are cylinder for obtaining a perfect mixed design and TRC plates on which impact load test was done. Experimental setup covers the setup of compressive strength test, union cell tensile strength test, and impact load test. Materials. Ordinary Portland cement was used to make the concrete mixture. Fly ash was used to replace the unreacted cement. Well graded and gap graded sand was used. Because of the smaller opening of the textiles, maximum aggregate slice was 2.36 mm. A high performance super plasticizer admixture was used. GI fibers of 0.5% of cement weight was used in the concrete mixture having aspect ratio of 72 to increase the mechanical properties. Four types of textile reinforcements were used which are glass textile, GI textile of square and diagonal orientation and carbon textile. 
By several iterative attempts, we found a water cement ratio of 0.36 being highly effective with textile reinforcement, considering the replacement of about 30% of cement by fly ash. Slump height was found zero, which indicates that the workability of the mix is very low. Sample preparation. To perform crab tensile strength test, fiber textile specimen and textile reinforced mortar were made. Steel grip was attached using epoxy resin. The size of the specimen was 50 mm by 300 mm. The thickness for TRM specimens were 12 mm where 6 mm concrete cover was provided. TRC plates of 300 mm length and 170 mm width were made for dynamic loading test. 25, 50 and 75 mm thick plates were prepared. 12.5 mm concrete cover was provided from both sides for each plate. For the UniXL tensile strength test, the grips of the specimen were inserted inside the machine. Loading rate was 5 mm per minute for textile and 1 mm per minute for TRM. Drop weight impact test was done on TRC plates according to ACI Committee 554. 4.49 kg compaction hammer falling from 457 mm height provided impact load. A high resolution camera was used to calculate velocity. From the UniXL tensile strength test of fiber, we found that carbon and square oriented GI fiber has more tensile strength compared to other textile fibers. Carbon fiber appears to have minimum deflection and maximum tensile strength, 2.3% higher tensile strength than square oriented GI fiber. Carbon and square oriented GI fiber was used as reinforcement in the UniXL tensile strength of TRM. From the graph, it is seen that the failure load of carbon fiber TRM is slightly higher than GI fiber. GI fiber TRM had more deflection compared to that of carbon fiber. Cylinder specimens were tested by a compression testing machine after 7 days, 28 days and on the test day. The compressive strength of cylinder specimens increased 46% after 28 days curing and 112% on the plate test day. Impact load was applied to the plates until they failed. Number of blows needed for the plates to fail was observed. With the increase in thickness, number of blows increased proportionally. Using this data, various properties are measured. The obtained result was compared with a research where they used 0.5% steel fiber. Our obtained blow numbers were 3 to 4 times higher. From the velocity of the falling hammer, dynamic and static impact energy of the plates was measured using the equation shown here. Carbon textile reinforced plates had more impact energy compared to others. However, with the increasing thickness, the difference between carbon and square oriented GI fiber reinforced plates decreased. These results were again compared with a research for 0.5% steel fiber. Our obtained dynamic impact energy was in average 5 times higher. Mass loss was measured using the initial and final mass of the plates. Glass textile reinforced plates undergone maximum mass loss. Carbon and square oriented GI textile reinforced plates showed almost similar percentage of mass loss, almost half compared to glass TRC plates. This result was compared with a research for quad axial carbon fiber textile. Our obtained data were in average 7 times higher. Failure pattern In figure 1, we see the surface where impact load was applied. Figure 2 shows that weaker bonding caused the glass textile to be pulled off of the concrete after ultimate failure occurred. Figure 3 shows that the short GI fibers helped in resisting impact load. And Figure 4 shows that the bond failure was significant more with carbon TRC plates. 
Lastly, we can conclude that tensile tests of textiles show that carbon textile has 2.4% higher tensile strength than square oriented GI fiber and comparatively low elongation. TRM with carbon and GI square textiles have almost similar failure load but GI square TRM has 30% higher extension. Drop weight impact test shows that 50 mm thick carbon TRC plates have 117% higher impact energy than 50 mm thick GI square TRC plates but it decreases to 26% for 75 mm thick plates. Mass loss in GI square and carbon TRC plates have almost similar results. This research work narrates that carbon fiber TRCs show quite better performance than GI square TRCs but in a close range. With the increase in thickness, GI square TRC shows better performance. Therefore, less expensive square oriented GI fiber textile can be an alternative option for carbon fiber textile. Thank you. Okay, uh, since we are just about time, we might not have a Q&A session. Uh, if you are interested, please just message or email our author. So next, let's welcome our uh, last speaker, Juraj Puma. Uh, Juraj, uh, would you like to share your screen? Yeah, okay, great. The floor yeah. is yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone, and uh, I'm here, uh, Thiras Kumar. I'm going to present on ultra fast laser micro nano structure multifunctional carbon fiber and post composite for aerospace application. Uh, so, first of all, uh, actually laser surface functionalization is a kind of uh, technique people used in many applications. It has a variety of application and it has a variety of properties. So I'm just summarizing a few of the things here. So in photonics, uh, also uh, many researchers are using and uh, to improve the data communication uh, properties and also to improve the data storage. Uh, as well as you can see in biology and medicine, they used a structure material and uh, to how that to just to see the how the bacteria reacting with the structure and unstructured materials. Particularly when we talk about the weighting and fluid transport, that is a very interesting for particularly in case of laser surface functionalization. So here, uh, many researchers focus on the things like how to generate a uh, like nature inspired structure on metal or composite or even in um, polymers. It is also used in dental implants where uh, uh, it's depend upon the kind of uh, application because in some of the cases they need uh, cell addition, some of the cases they don't need it, some of the cases they need it uh, like to improve uh, corrosion resistance and all. So it depends upon variety of application, and then it's also depend the what kind of a structure need to be gen generated on the surface that we have differently. Particularly that uh, when we come about the uh, uh, ice phobic, so this is the main Hello? concern. With the, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. 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 Okay, uh, so uh, ice phobic is mainly concerned uh, to the uh, related to the aerospace and uh, as well as like wind energy. So, in many cases, we can see that uh, ice accumulation happened on the winds and then it causes increase the uh, weight and as well as it causes uh, some dynamics issue with the uh, aircraft structures. Uh, also, Hello? many. Hello. Hi, hello. Do, you have a... Hi, do you have a question? Uh, uh, 
seem like we have some Hello. Hello. Yeah, please speak. Um, please continue. I we are not sure what happening was previously. Yeah, sorry about ah, that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So here also, uh, uh, we I, I'm talking about that friction control. So by generating a different structure, we can also control the friction. So here. Uh, few things we summarized what exactly we are going to do is uh, we are going to generate a nano structure on CFRP surface by using ultra fast uh, laser and our aim is to first try to enhance the super hydrophobicity or in terms of this you can say we are trying to improve the hydrophobicity so that it can uh, like uh, remove water uh, and also it can uh, uh, act as a, like a self cleaning or further it can be like uh, anti-icing. So we, here we are also going to analyze the what kind of a structure we generated and what is the uh, their special periodicity. So these are the techniques that what I use. So we actually scan uh, uh, fiber in uh, parallel and as well as in perpendicular direction with the different laser parameters, with the different scan speeds. We've changes the fluence level from 0 0.30 to 1.90 joule CMS square and the hash distance we use 20 to uh, 40 micrometer. And these are that uh, our uh, analysis that what we performed till now, XPS analysis we are going to include in proceeding. Here we haven't included. Uh, so a static contact angle we are going to analyze then surface morphology, then the generated laser induced periodic surface structure periodicity. And also we are going to analyze how uh, the, by using a Raman spectroscopy to see that how our structure is looks like and what exactly and when graphitization is happened with the surface. So this kind of a structures generated on the single carbon fiber and then we perform the FFT. And this is the technique then we use to find out the two kind of lips formed one is the high special frequency lips, another is the low special frequency lips. And then we plotted our results with a different fluence and we can see with increasing fluence, we seen that the periodicity of lips increasing for the almost all parameters, but two parameters shows the, uh, there is a lips, but we are unable to calculate in exact way because it all are covered with nanoprotosons. So we just summarize it here by using a image, SEM images. When we scanned our uh, surface, when the parallel is, uh, when the fiber is perpendicular to the scanning directions, only on few of the uh, structure surfaces we have seen there is a lips form, but the most of the structure are covered with nanoprotosan. So we are unable to find out the exact uh, periodicity of generated structures. Uh, these are the SEM analysis. We can see that this kind of uh, at the lower fluence and uh, lower scan speed that accumulated fluence is more. So we can see the little bit of uh, erosion of uh, fiber and then you can see the finally a structures fiber here all around and as we increase the uh, periodicity we uh, uh, sorry hash distance we can see this is the very nice structures generated on the carbon fiber and it's very fine it has a periodicity around 84 nanometer as we increase further the scan speed we have a almost uniform structure over the carbon fiber and further, when we increase the hash distance is actually throughout the surface, we have generated this kind of a structure. Roman analysis we have done and actually we calculated the D by G ratio to find out uh, at what parameters and what condition it has a more graphitization and uh, how that we actually correlated with two different uh, scanning direction. So 
this is at a higher fluence and here we can see uh, this kind of a structure which has a, a higher periodicity and and uh, like at the, this last one you can see this is the finally higher periodicity uh, lips generated over the structure and it's also give a super hydrophobicity behavior but here we just gonna to analyze uh, this uh, our different test like uh, d by g ratio and mainly d by g ratio indicates that when its value is higher means the graph uh, like the surface like when the means we can say that the carbon fiber is more towards the graphitization process and when it is a less uh, sorry when it is a less then it is more and when it is higher then it is a less then we also um, compared with the parallel direction and here as i said before we can see the most of the structure fibers are covered with nanoprotrusions and we can see the corresponding uh, raman uh, analysis and its corresponding dyg ratio but in parallel direction when we performed at higher fluence we haven't seen a very clear structure but it's a kind of like exposed fiber only left over the surface and then we have a, this corresponding uh, Raman spectroscopy and here we can correlate to one uh, sample to perpendicular at the lower fluence and at the higher fluence and we can see here it is less means at 0 0.30 joule for CMA square we are getting more graphitization as compared to the higher fluence. A CA measurement we have performed and then we have a contact angle uh, more than 150 degree that means the surface indicating a super hydrophobic behavior and also for the parallel we just selected few parameters to show here and we can see that a higher uh, periodic uh, structure shows a lower contact angle as compared to the finer one that means the high spatial frequency has a capacity to improve the surface hydrophobicity uh, more as compared to this one. We plotted it uh, with a different fluence and we can see the few of the parameter is lower than our desired values like 150 degrees and the almost all parameters shows uh, super hydrophobic behavior. So here are the conclusions, actually we generated a lips all over the surface and we scan in two different direction. We actually observed uh, lips periodicity varies from 84 nanometer to 327 nanometer. Uh, particularly when we performed the, uh, this kind of scanning, we have seen the two kind of lips formed when the fiber and the scanning direction is same, but in particular perpendicular direction, only few parameters shows lips formation. So uh, these are the two parameters where we have seen a super hydrophobic behavior for both a scanning direction. However, higher fluence and higher scanning speed doesn't in uh, favorable for our particularly to achieve a super hydrophobicity. Raman uh, spectroscopy analysis shows that uh, particularly in this case in the uh, scanning direction which is perpendicular to the fiber that uh, less graphitization happened at the higher fluence for almost all a scan speed and has distance. Thank you. If you have any questions, please. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation and sorry for, for the disruptions during the middle. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay. Um, okay, it, it seems like we have another session which will be uh, beginning very soon. So uh, let's probably stop here. And if we have questions, probably just a message or just email our uh, speakers and thank you for your nice presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank uh, thank you, Chi, uh, Chi, for the assistance. So I will thank stop you. here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. You too.